Comedy Hype News. I'm Jay Brandon. He was the second overall pick in the 1986 NBA draft, selected ahead of noble figure Dill Curry, father of Stephen Curry, and future Hall of Famer Dennis Robin. The Boston Celtics had huge plans for their latest draft pick, coming off a championship win with plans on winning another with their newest addition to the team. With one of the best jump shots in the nation and a vertical reaching well over 40 inches, Lynn Bias was unstoppable even compared to his rival, Michael Jordan. By many accounts, Bias was the better player. He could jump higher and shoot better than Jordan. Would he have been the better professional player? We can only wonder. Bias would go on to earn the ACC Player of the Year in 1985 and 1986. To this day, he is the only player to accomplish this feat back to back. Bias was only drafted two years after Michael Jordan and many predicted the two would dominate the league throughout the 90s. Unfortunately, the expectations that college and NBA scouters put on Bias never materialized because two days after he was drafted by the Boston Celtics, Bias died from cardiac arrhythmia caused by a cocaine overdose. Those who had the opportunity to see him play were stunned by his explosiveness and his effortless ability to hover over any contestant, but he became known as one of the best college basketball players of his time. In all, he was a local kid turned legend who left us with a mountain of what-ifs. This is the story of what could have been. The story of how tragedy will serve as a mirror to reflect the complexities of college sports and society as a whole. The tragic and mysterious death of college superstar Lynn Bias. Born Leonard Kevin Bias to James and Lanise Bias, Lynn was raised in a suburb of Landover, Maryland. The Bias family lived just a few blocks from Columbia Park Recreational Center, where Lynn would experience his earliest moments with a basketball in his hands. Although he was clearly athletically built, he didn't have as much coordination growing up as you would think a future basketball superstar would have. However, once Bias grew into himself and passed the ninth grade, you could really see the potential of greatness begin to form. He went from a kid who was tall for his age, who could duck a basketball, to an athlete who dedicated time and effort to improve his skills. His mother, Dr. Lonise Bias, told in an interview, I just thought it was an opportunity for him to be involved in some type of sports activity that would keep him occupied, but it blossomed into something completely different, she said. You can see the progression from this little lanky kid in middle school to an all-star athlete by the time he was in high school. Bias attended Northwestern High School, where he would continue to develop his skills. He didn't show up as the best player in the school. Upon his graduation, Lynn didn't have college recruiters lined up, but there was nationwide interest. He decided to stay close to home and attend the University of Maryland. Bias did not enter the campus as a star player. His coach, Lefty Drizel, would not start him his first 13 games as a freshman, but each year, Bias improved. The true testament of his distinction came on the day of the 1986 NBA draft. Many saw it coming. The Boston Celtics were dominating the league, coming off of a 67-15 season and a championship win. The Boston Celtics president at the time had traded Gerald Henderson in 1984, the same year he had invited Lynn Bias to one of his training camps and sat down with his family for dinner. If you were paying attention, you knew what was coming on that 17th day of June in 1986. At the Felt Forum in New York City, Lynn Bias was selected as a second overall pick to the Boston Celtics. The moment is marked by the wide smile Bias flashed as he put on his Celtics cap. He was expected to become the next star for the NBA's greatest dynasty. After a day of interviews in New York, Bias and his father flew to Boston to answer more questions from the press for a signing ceremony with the Celtics coach and management. Similar to Michael Jordan's trajectory with Nike, Lynn also had a major shoe deal in the works with Reebok worth $1.6 million. Once business was handled in Boston, Bias was just ready to go home, as he told the Reebok executives, who had a limousine waiting for him to take him back to the airport. He couldn't wait to see his mother. The hours that followed after Bias returned to Maryland could be looked at as a celebration. There was a lot to be excited about, but it could also be seen as an escape. An escape from the flashing lights, the endless questions, and from growing responsibility that came along with being a neighborhood hero. After all, Lynn was known to be a bit difficult with reporters and wasn't exactly a fan of the spotlight. However you choose to view it, when Lynn drove back to campus on the night of June 18th, he was ready to party. He hung out with friends and roommates at his dorm, answering their questions about the newfound fame before leaving off-campus gathering around midnight. 
He returned with longtime friend Brian Tribble and his teammates Terry Long and David Gregg, with whom he shared a suite, that it was time to celebrate. The group stayed up doing cocaine for hours. At about 6.30 a.m. in the Washington Hall Suite of the University of Maryland campus, Lynn Pius began to have seizures and became unresponsive. Tribble called 911 while his roommates called Bias' mother. Lynn was taken to the Leland Memorial Hospital where he was pronounced dead at 8.55 a.m. Later, the cause of death was determined to be cocaine intoxication. No one could fathom the passing of a such monumental figure, let alone the reason for his death. This was Lynn Bias. His nickname was The Horse. He was indestructible. Not to mention, to a lot of his peers, he hadn't even been known to take a sip of alcohol. Lynn was kind, he was humble, and hardworking. To most, it just didn't make sense that he would die in this way. Was this the first time experimenting with cocaine? Was he pressured into using it? To the average fan, classmates, and even his parents, these were valid questions. But there were some who knew that Lynn had been recreationally using cocaine throughout his senior year. Still, these questions loomed over the public and led a major revelation regarding the University of Maryland's athletic program. It also caused the government to take action when it came to drug use in America. It seemed as though the public needed a scapegoat. The fact that maybe Lynn just would celebrate a little too hard in his dorm room that morning wasn't acceptable. Someone had to be held accountable. The search would start with the University of Maryland and the athletic department. In conjunction with an independent grand jury investigation to find exactly what happened the night of Lynn Bice's death, the university's board of regents approved the launch of a campus-wide study of an academic and drug policy for its student athletes. The fact that our entire society has a drug problem has been brought home to us in a powerful and extremely poignant way in Leonard Bice's death. A chairman of the board of regents told the NY Times, We do not believe that the University of Maryland College Park has a problem with drug use that is disproportionate to other institutions or to society as a whole. This examination revealed something that no one was prepared to believe. Lynn Bias failed or dropped every single class he was registered for his senior year. He was 21 credits shy of the required amount to graduate. The weight of these facts, now public, led to the resignation of the basketball team's academic advisor, Wendy Whitmore. Whitmore stated that she didn't feel that education was a top prior for Drizel, and that players generally missed 35% to 40% of their classes during the season. It was later learned that the semester of Bias' passing, only two Maryland players had earned so much as a C average. The investigation also uncovered that the Terrapin basketball coach, Lefty Drizel, had instructed the players to remove any drugs from Lynn's room on the morning of his death. There was consideration to indict Drizel for obstruction of justice. The grand jury decided that since there was no ill intention behind Drizel's instructions, that he would not be indicted. The controversy, however, did lead to his resignation a few months later. Shortly before that, the University of Maryland's athletic director, Dick Dull, also resigned amid the media frenzy. The search for blame didn't stop there. The three men who were with Bias on the night that he died were also brought up on criminal charges. His teammates Terry Long and David Gregg were being charged with possession of cocaine as well as obstruction of justice. Among other charges, Bias's friend Brian Treble was indicted on counts of possession of cocaine and possession of cocaine with intent to distribute. Essentially, he was being accused of supplying the cocaine that killed Lynn Bias. Long and Greg had their charges dismissed in exchange for testifying against Brian Tribble. Tribble would be acquitted of the charges a year later, but not before being put through the ringer, having his character tarnished by the law, his peers, and the media, even after they found more cocaine under the seat in Bias's car after investigation. In America's haste to make amends for the sins of Lynn Bias, it opened Pandora's box, addressing it as a war on drugs. Lynn Bice's death became the catalyst for drug laws that would end up hurting rather than helping young black men. There was less focus on educating the masses on drug awareness where there was an obvious ignorance. Instead, the goal was a harsher punishment. In the summer of 1986, the dangers of crack cocaine were spread all over the media, resulting in mass nervousness regarding the drug. Lynn Bias became the face of this campaign, although he had died of the powder form of the drug and not crack. As some rumors had alleged, this widespread fear of the results of drug use aided the decision of the House of Representatives to pass it as an Anti-Drug Abuse Act in 1986, and it was soon signed into law by President Reagan. 
The legislation, commonly known as the Lynn Bias Law, established mandatory minimum sentences for various drug offenses and also called for life imprisonment for anyone who distributed drugs that resulted in the death of another person. One of the most unjust parts of this law was the massive gap between the amounts of crack cocaine and powder that would result in the same sentence. Possession of 5 grams of crack led to an automatic 5-year sentence, while it took the possession of 500 grams of powder cocaine to get the same sentence. 80% of crack users in the 80s were black, so this law led to the disproportionate increase in the incarceration rates of nonviolent black drug offenders. This legislation is a small portion of what led to what we know as mass incarceration, which has also affected the black community since the 80s and even until this day. People who are close to Lynn, like his mother, Dr. Lonise Byers, chose not to focus on the complexity of her son and what his death meant to society. Dr. Byers chose to honor him in her work as a motivational speaker and a youth and family life coach. Lynn Byers was a born again Christian who brought his teammates to the same church he grew up in. He considered himself a role model for kids. He was known for his bright smile and contagious spirit. When it came to basketball, he was overly dedicated and a natural leader. Was he just a kid who made a fatal mistake, or was he failed by a larger system that was supposed to protect him? For Comedy Hype News, I'm Jay Brandon.